music, and angels. Which was the first to ever exist? Now before we answer the question, you may be thinking about it, but before I give you the answer, I want to talk about the lineage of Cain. You know about Cain and Abel. These are the first two children of Adam and Eve. Cain, of course, killed Abel, but Cain had a lineage of children, and it's recorded in Genesis 4. Adam and Eve also had another son named Seth. His lineage is also recorded, and he gave, eventually led to Enoch, who was the holy man of God who was translated into heaven. And then, of course, after that, Noah. So Seth's lineage is the holy lineage. Cain is the murderer, and his lineage, you see some very interesting things. Let me put the lineages up on the screen here for you. You can see Cain's descendants. Uh, he had an Enoch in his, in his genealogy as well. That's not the Enoch, but then you have Irad and Mahujael all the way on down to Lamech. Now, Lamech is an interesting one because he was the first person ever mentioned in the Bible to practice polygamy. Now, isn't it fitting that polygamy, having multiple wives, is something that is not of God, obviously. Adam and Eve, there was one man, one woman. But the first mention of polygamy just so happens to be in Cain's lineage. Cain is a lineage of rebellion, of doing things outside of the way that God designed. Cain himself offered a sacrifice, a, 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 an offering to God that was not an animal sacrifice like God required, but it was just his fruit and vegetable that he offered to the Lord. Cain's lineage is the example of the rebellion against God. Now, given that fact, it's very interesting that there are a few things that are mentioned in the lineage of Cain for the first time in the Bible. Now, there's a biblical interpretive method called the principle of first mention. When you find something mentioned in the Bible for the first time, pay special attention to it. It's going to carry with it some extra significance. For example, the first time that wine is mentioned in the Bible, meaning alcoholic wine. It happens to be when Noah had gotten drunk, and then some very shameful and bad things happened. So the interpreter of the Bible, and this method goes all the way back to before the time of Jesus. The, the, the rabbis would look at the Bible, and they'd say, this is the first time this is mentioned. It must have a special significance to it. It's a warning against the dangers of wine, isn't it? Well, what else is in the lineage of Cain? You also find the first mention of a city. Now, are cities evil? Not necessarily. We have the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God to this earth in the last events of, of Revelation. But cities also became hotbeds of iniquity in the Bible. Cities like Babylon were symbolic of, of wickedness and evil. Also in the lineage of Cain, you find the first mention of metalworking. Now, what is the danger with metalworking? Well, what did they use metal for in the ancient times? It was most, most famously used for implements of warfare. So you've got cities, you've got implements of warfare, you've got polygamy, all first mentioned in the lineage of Cain. Also, the first mention of the raising of livestock, which obviously led to the consumption of meat and animal food. Um, the consumption of animal flesh as a part of the human diet came in later, not part of God's design in the Garden of Eden. So we see the principle of first mention, very important with these items here. A warning about the dangers of these things. Cities, warfare, implements of war, uh, meat eating, some things that are outside of God's design for us. Guess what else is mentioned in the lineage of Cain, the first mention of this in the Bible. Music. Genesis 4 verse 21 says, His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play stringed instruments and pipes. So my ears perk up and I go, okay, well the principle of first mention suggests that this is an important fact about music to pay attention to. And it is in the lineage of who again? Cain. So this is a warning. This is a warning. Music may be used in a negative way. It may be used by Satan. And in fact, let's turn to Satan, because music existed even before Jubal did. Music existed as the gift given to Lucifer in heaven. It says the following about Lucifer. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was pre prepared, prepared for you on the day you were created. This is a passage widely known to be about Lucifer, who then fell and became Satan. And of course, it was, he was given the gift of timbrels and pipes. These are musical instruments. So music even predated the lineage of Cain, because Lucifer was up in heaven before earth was ever created. So let's trace it back even further, actually. The origins of music. You, you find in the three different sections of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible, you find in the law, in the prophets, in the writings, the following statement about God. It's written three times. 
God is my strength, salvation, and song. God is my strength, salvation, and song. And God is my strength, salvation, and song. It shows up in the law, in the writings, and in the prophets. Here it is in Psalm 118, verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So music even predated Lucifer. God is our song. In fact, we see God in human flesh, Jesus. He sang in Matthew 26, verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives and so on. Now, interestingly, this was at the Passover dinner. And at the Passover, they would have a liturgy of the, a singing of various psalms. Psalms 113 to Psalm 118. So the last psalm that they would have sung when they sung a hymn and then left would have been Psalm 118. Well, guess what it says in Psalm 118? We just saw this graphic. The Lord is my strength and my song. So they were singing about the fact that the Lord was their song. So God is song. God is, there is something within God that is musical. In fact, God himself sings, not just Christ, but the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that beautiful? So, yes, the music can be used for great evil. It was, it was Lucifer's gift in heaven. We're going to talk about that more going forward. And, of course, it's mentioned in the lineage of Cain, which is a warning because Cain's lineage is that of wickedness. But, nonetheless, let's remember that music is from God. In fact, we were created in God's image. Is it any surprise now that you love music so much, that it speaks to your soul so much? Some recent research has been done about the human DNA. This is absolutely fascinating to me. They've taken the protein sequence and the DNA sequence, the bases of them, and they've assigned each amino acid a pitch. And they'll, they'll have the less soluble acids, amino acids that are, that are within the fold in the interior of the molecule have lower pitches, and then the further you get out from that, the higher the pitch is. And they'll, they'll create that into music. This is what your DNA and, and your protein sequence sounds like when tr translated to music. was the human speech gene. Isn't that amazing? We are wired, our very DNA is wired musically. This one is the blue cone receptor. It's beautiful, isn't it? beautiful. That's wired within us. And not just us, the heavens declare the glory of God with musical tones. Did you know that the planets in our solar system are producing musical tones? Outer space is literally filled with sounds. And over 90% of the tones created by the planetary proportions belong to the major scale. They produce, they produce music. And not just that, but God has made it so that we can hear it. The sound spectrum of the five visible planets covers the eight octaves that are almost identical to the human hearing range. Is that an accident? We have an amazing God, don't we? Music at the root of it all. And here we have our answer to our quiz then. What came first? The Sabbath, marriage, music, or angels? The first thing ever was music. Because it is a part of who God is. We are created in His image. Music is a part of who we are. Music existed before God ever created angels. Angels, of course, came second. Lucifer was given the gift of music. And then we have the creation of this earth with marriage coming in on the sixth day, Adam and Eve becoming one flesh, and the seventh day, the Sabbath, coming forth out of those items. Well, unfortunately, it gets a lot more ugly than this. We have to look at a bit of the dark side of music and how Satan has used music to, to, in a way to distort what God designed it to be. And I want to begin with the top Satanist of the 20th century, Aleister Crowley. In fact, he didn't want to just be a Satanist. He said, I want to be the chief of staff of Satan himself. The BBC called him the wickedest man in the world. He called himself Satan's chief of staff, of course. And he also said regarding music, that you can become a genius in music through practicing his Satanism. 
Now that's an important point as we go forward looking at music. There's a link between music and Satanism. You'll see that forming even more strongly. In addition to being into Eastern mysticism and practicing uh, every form of, of immorality that I won't even mention, he also said regarding music that you, you, you can use music and we ought to use music and an army of youth, an important phrase, we'll come back to that, an army of youth to bring in the new age. And then last of all, he suggested as one of his satanic occult practices, have a secret room with moving mirrors to invoke spirits. I wouldn't suggest anybody do that, obviously. You don't want to dabble in spiritualism. But I mentioned this technique because it's going to come up later. It might feel a little random right now, but remember that. Hang it on a hook in your brain. Army of youth, secret room with moving mirrors. We'll come back to that. He called the family public enemy number one. And he said, here is my philosophy in a nutshell. In his book of the law, Aleister Crowley stated, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Do whatever you want to do. That's the whole of the law. Jesus said the whole of the law is summed up with love God, love your neighbor, everything else hangs from that. But Aleister Crowley said, no, 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 there is no law. He says, I want blasphemy, rape, murder, revolution, anything strong. Satanic, absolutely satanic. The Lord says, observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. It's for our own good. God gives us a law to live by because that's how we were designed to thrive. That's how we were designed to experience life to the fullest. But Satanism says that you can be a God unto yourself by making your own rules. You don't need a God in heaven to tell you how you were designed to live. You make your own rules. Satanism also says that you find the truth within. You don't find the truth in the Word of God, from, from God. You find the truth within yourself. And then last of all, the third teaching of modern Satanism is to follow your own desires, follow your feelings, or as it's famously been stated, follow your heart. Notice, by the way, this goat symbolism. We're going to come back to that as well. This is a Satanic pentagram with Baphomet, the goat god. And on that matter of follow your heart, you, may have, you might say, I think I've heard that somewhere before. You've heard it in lyrics in the music industry. We're going to cover that. But also I should mention that it's been most famously the philosophy of the movies that have come out of Disney. The idea of following your heart. It's a very sentimental feeling. It sounds nice. It sounds cute. It sounds harmless. But when you really think about what that message is, and check out the documentary on that called Magic Kingdom, uh, an excellent expose of what's happening in Disney and the philosophy in, in these movies. It's satanic. It absolutely is. By the way, you see here, following your own desires, if you read a, an excellent 19th century work called The Great Controversy, you will read that already in the 19th century, the spirits were appearing in, in the spiritualist movement of the 19th century, and they were declaring, desire is the highest law. So even before Aleister Crowley was ever around, this modern movement of spiritualism or Satanism was already underway. In fact, Crowley died in 1947. Remember that date, we'll come back to it. And after he died, Timothy Leary viewed himself as the, the, the torchbearer for, for Aleister Crowley's cause. He was a professor, actually, at Harvard University in the 1960s. He advocated the use of mind-altering substances. He advocated the use of music, more on that later, to alter your consciousness. Here's what he had to say about the rock and roll era. He said it was the revelation of the glory of what Aleister Crowley started. The so-called glory of what Aleister Crowley started. Now, if you know your American history, you know the 1960s was the decade when morality took a nosedive where America became much more debased, the sexual revolution took place, and also and divorce rates went up. Things got very, very bad beginning in the 1960s. And that is in part due in part to this movement. But let's take a look at the movement. Here are the, is the biggest name of the, of the 60s, of course, the Beatles. Now, we're going to be looking at a bunch of different groups. It's not a seminar just on the Beatles, but I want to analyze this album for a moment. This is Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They put a bunch of different people on their album cover that quote, according to John Lennon, people we admire and like. And according to John Lennon, he says the whole Beatle idea was to do what you want, right? And then what does he say? Do what thou wilt. Who is he quoting there? This is Aleister Crowley. Do what thou wilt. That's the whole Beatle idea. You thought it was just nice melodies and pretty harmonies and good sounding music. 
It was a philosophy. The whole Beatle idea was do what thou wilt. In fact, John Lennon said, I sold my soul to the devil. And guess who shows up in on the album cover on the top left, second in? None other than Aleister Crowley himself. Interestingly, he's more than just one person on the album cover. This album was released in 1967. One of the lyrics in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band goes like this. 20 years ago today, Sgt. Pepper taught the band to play. What happened 20 years before 1967? 1947 was when Aleister Crowley died. In addition to that, it's called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And Aleister Crowley said we needed to bring in a what of youth? An army. These are subtle but not so subtle suggestions here of where their loyalty lies. Quoting Aleister Crowley, putting him on the album cover, and even naming the album cover after their great hero, Sergeant. Led Zeppelin also was very much an admirer, uh, Jimmy Page that is, an admirer of, of, of Crowley. Page said, I feel Crowley's a misunderstood genius of the 20th century. Because his whole thing was liberation of the person. What you want to do, do it. I've employed his system in my own day-to-day -day life, and that is the way big names are made these days. So if you made it up in the music industry to the highest levels, you did it by employing Crowley's system in your day-to-day -day life. The do what thou will philosophy is what Jimmy Page was talking about. He said all the big names are doing that. But it's not just the acid rock you know, of, of the 60s with Led Zeppelin where we find admiration of Aleister Crowley. Crowley's admirers span the gamut. They, they, they're from all genres of music, even from Sammy Davis Jr. onto The Doors with Jim Morrison. Probably no surprise about Jim Morrison there. Mick Jagger, uh, David Bowie. David Bowie's an interesting one because he was probably the greatest trendsetter in music history. And he actually had a song where he said, I'm wearing Crowley's uniform. He declared his interest in Crowleyism, and he actually stated that rock has always been the devil's music. He said, you can't convince me that it's not. I believe we're heralding something darker than ourselves. He was kind of scared by it, actually. Jim Morrison, he was a self-proclaimed shaman. He received entire songs en masse, would see the whole concert in advance, and then just copy down what he was seeing and then act it out. This is what he explained. Moving on, Ozzy Osbourne, this is probably no surprise, Black Sabbath, naming your band, something intentionally satanic and dark. And in fact, B Black Sabbath was made up of four band members, but they, always, they talked about their fifth band member, who was a demon. Uh, they were studying Crowley, they were studying the, in the occult, and a uh, manifestation appeared at the foot of the bed of one of the band members, the bassist, and they started saying, well, he's a part of our band now. Iron Maiden and Sting. Sting always takes people by surprise as well because you don't think of him as being dark and satanic and, and, and evil in, in his songs. He's on the light rock station, right? He's who the, the good people listen to who aren't listening to the scary, evil uh, Ozzy Osbourne music. Well, Sting actually was a advocate of Aleister Crowley and he was into the occult. Um, he, he, he read Crowley's writings and used tarot cards that were, that were created by Crowley. He said his favorite tarot card was the death card, the Grim Reaper. So, not quite as uh, light as he appears. Michael Jackson. Listen to this quote from Michael Jackson. I have my own secret room with a moving wall and mirrors. That's where I talk to Lee Liberace. His is the voice I hear in there. I feel his presence so very close to me. So Michael Jackson, very much into spiritualism. He's an important person, an important piece of this puzzle as we analyze the music industry. He's the king of pop. Michael Jackson, hugely important. Very much into communicating with the dead, which of course is communicating with demons. Moving on to the 1990s, this was my favorite band in the early 90s. Uh, Kurt Cobain, a very disturbed individual, was a obsessed with Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey is the founder of the Church of Satan. Um, Nirvana also, of course, the band that he founded. Brian Adams, not quite as you know, edgy as your Nirvanas and, and, and Led Zeppelin and, and, and Ozzy Osbourne. He, he would be you know, one that you would think is okay. But he says the overall theme is a need to break out, free of conventional thought and not be bound by what we are told is right and wrong. We don't want to be bound by right and wrong. Do what thou wilt is the philosophy. Break free of conventional thought. Don't be bound by these things called right and wrong. Well, 
When you get on to the modern times, we still find adherence to Crowleyanism. In fact, Jay-Z has a clothing line that he has put out as a rapper. And he's an entrepreneur. He said, my brands are an extension of myself. And what does it say on the sweatshirt that he has produced and sold with his clothing line? It says, do what thou wilt. This is why some clever graphic artists on the internet put together Crowley and Jay-Z, called them the dynamic duo. I can't disagree. Speaking of Jay-Z, this is a song. The beat to this song was played at the halftime show of a basketball game at a, at a Christian college near to where I live. It goes like this. I live by you desire. Pause right there. What did that 19th century work, the great controversy, talk about when it said the spirits are declaring something in the 19th century already? Desire is the highest law. He's spouting the very same philosophy. I live by you desire. Your love is my scripture. This, this, is, this is a new religion. We formed a new religion. The love of desire is the religion that he's preaching. No sins as long as there's permission. And the context of that is sexual things that I won't, that I won't get into right now. I put dot, dot, dot because there was a lot of inappropriate things. Talking about orgies. It says love is cursed by monogamy. Love is cursed by monogamy. In other words, so-called love is better when you're experiencing it with many different people. Monogamy is fidelity to one spouse, one sexual partner for life. They believe that love is cursed by that. Their version of love is not monogamy. And then it ends with, it's something that the, pre- the pastor don't preach. And that's the one line in the song I agree with. I have to agree that the pastor is not preaching, live by your desire and don't be monogamous in your relationships. But these pastors are preaching it. Jay-Z and Kanye West and others, they have a much wider audience than our Christian pastors today. And so that pastor is preaching it. We just don't think of him as a pastor, but he's preaching Crowley and spiritualism. He's preaching satanic worldviews here. And he's not the only one, of course. Do what thou wilt is the philosophy of the music industry. I've compiled a bunch of different lyrics from many different musicians from across the decades and across the genres. This is not just rock. It's not just hip hop. You'll have your country, your, your R&B, your jazz. It's all in here. And here we go. The first one, the most satanic song of the 20th century, according to Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, was Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way. And if you think about it, I Did It My Way is very much a Crowleyan statement, isn't it? I Did It My Way. And then subsequent musicians sang songs like, like Frankie said, I Did It My Way. So they're tipping their hat to Frank Sinatra. Other musicians sang, I'm free to do what I want any old time. Do what you want to do. Whatever, whatever, whatever gets you. It's my life and I'll do what I want. Do what you want to do. What you want to do. Try hard to live your life. Live right the way you want. I need to do what I feel like doing. So let me go. I'm glad I didn't play that one because it's sung very sensually. Do what you want to do. Go out and seek your truth. I am what I am. I'll do what I want. Do what you want, go on and do what you want. Do what I want, because I can. If I don't, because I want to. Do what you want to do. There ain't no rules. Do anything you want to do. Do what you want. Do it, boy. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Do what you want. These are all different songs from different musicians. Let me hear you say it's my thing. I do what I want to do. Just be yourself any way that you want to, any way that you can. There's a whole other slide. Life is ours. We live it our way. The only way to find true happiness is to thine own self be true. True unto yourself, y'all. You've just got to believe. Believe in yourself. The truth is all within yourself. Trust your heart. Why second guess what feels so right? Just trust your heart and you'll see the light. True to your heart, you must be true to your heart. And remember, this trust your heart thing runs completely contrary to the scriptures, which says, which says, who can know the desperately wicked heart of mankind? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Trust your heart? No. Follow your heart and nothing else. I've come this far with the truth of my heart. This whole world can fall apart. You'll be okay. Follow your heart. Let your heart lead your mind. Follow your heart. You've got to follow your heart. Trust your heart. Listen to your heart and what it says. Listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. 
The heart won't lie. Isn't that the opposite of the verse I just quoted? Listen to your heart, girl. So you see very clearly the music industry of modern times, the modern, popular, secular music industry. It's just saturated with Crowleyan philosophy of do what thou wilt. You turn on your radio dial and you'll come across song after song spouting this philosophy. And if it's not in a direct line like these, it's subtle. Sometimes it's the, the message of the song, the, the undercurrents of the, the Crowleyan philosophy. This philosophy will be found there. But it leads me to a question. My question is, who is the musician behind the music? Aleister Crowley is not the greatest evil of all time. The devil, Satan, is. Is he involved with this? Or is this just human beings following another human being who happens to be misguided? And by the way, I would say Aleister Crowley is, next to Edward Bernays, this, uh, tied with him in the most influential people in American cultural history. Edward Bernays is number one. Aleister Crowley is number two. These guys had a huge effect on transforming American culture. But who's the musician behind the music? I'm more interested in the spiritual question than just the human historical question. Let's begin with Robert Johnson. He's not the musician behind the music, but he is the guy that initiated and invented the rock and roll style guitar. It was blues that led to rock and roll. He invented the sound. He had a mentor, a musical mentor named Sun House. Sun House explained that, his, that Robert Johnson was talentless. He said the guy was terrible. He'd get run out of the music clubs because people said, get that racket out of here. He cannot play. Well, Robert Johnson went away for six to nine months. At 61 and 49 in Clarksdale, Mississippi, at that crossroads, the crossroads, there were songs later written about this. It's, it's, a, it's a tourist attraction to this day. This is the place where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil. Now, that's just not, my, not just my claim. Sun House said, quote, he sold his soul to the devil to be able to play like that. Because when he came back from 61 and 49, when he came back to the clubs, he, Sun House said he never needed to learn a song. He'd just hear a song and he knew it. And he could play in ways that held audiences spellbound. And some of his songs testified to this spiritualist deal that he had made. He sang about the hellhound on my trail. And he sang about me and the devil walking side by side. So this is a very serious beginning of the rock and roll music movement, which became just popular music in general in America. The origins of it are a deal with the devil to help him be able to play the guitar. Remember, Satan does know how to play music. He's a musician. But uh, it wasn't just Robert Johnson, of course. Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Led Zeppelin, others paid homage to Robert Johnson's selling his soul to the devil. They would, some of them would go grab some gravel from that from that uh, intersection, 61 and 49, keep it as a memento or, or, or sing a song called The Crossroads in one of their cases. But we move on to the 1950s. This is where rock and roll really got underway. Little Richard, probably just as much of the king of rock and roll as Elvis himself. Here's what R Little Richard said. I was directed and commanded by another power, the power of darkness that a lot of people don't believe exists, the power of the devil, Satan. I think he said it about every possible way he could there. Yeah, let me be very, very clear here. I was directed by that one, the devil, Satan, the power of darkness, that guy. He was the one directing me, says little Richard. Can't question that one. He was as clear as he could be. So the rock and roll movement in the 50s, again, rooted in satanic things happening, like Screamin' Jay Hawkins. The original recording of I Put a Spell on You was done after the Screamin' Jay Hawkins and his band members got drunk and some type of presence seemed to seize him. He began grunting, growling, screaming, gurgling in strange unknown tongues and wildly dancing around the studio. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's a very demonic experience happening in the 1950s with these early musicians. And I always find it not funny, but sad when people say, you know, musicians these days or movies these days are not like they used to be in the good old days. Oh, man, you saw in session two, the earliest movie scripts in America, Rudolph Valentino, Mae West, they were coming from the demonic realm, channeled to the script writers. Same thing with these early musicians. There was no good old days in the American entertainment industry. It's been spiritualism since the start. When you go on to the 60s, you see the same thing. Again, the Beatles. John Lennon said, I felt like a hollow temple filled with many spirits, each one passing through me, each inhabiting me for a little time and then leaving to be replaced by another. So all these big musicians from the early years demonic possession. He says that the, these spirits were, were, were inhabiting me. 
In fact, is that possibly where he got his songs from? He says, talking about the writing of his songs, I don't know who the blank writes it. I'm just sitting and the whole blank song comes out. Spiritualism is where we're getting the early music of the rock and roll movement. And it's not just John Lennon, the Rolling Stones. Keith Richards said the same thing. Songs, yeah, they think you wrote it? Really, you are just a, what? A medium. Like being at a seance. Some songs come to me en masse. I, don't, I didn't do anything except to happen to have been awake when it arrived. So I'm like a medium. People think I wrote the songs? <laughs> no, really, I'm just a medium for these songs. Ginger Baker of the band Cream said it this way. It happens to us quite often. It feels as though I'm not playing my instrument. Something else is playing it. And that same thing is playing all three of our instruments. That's what I mean when I say it's frightening sometimes. We'll all play the same phrase out of nowhere. It happens very often with us. They didn't even really know what they were a part of. They were kind of scared by it. He says it's kind of frightening. I'm not even playing my instrument. Something else is playing my instrument and all three in the band are being played by the same force, the same spirit, whatever you might want to call this. Very, very demonic. So the, 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 the demonic realm is inspiring the writing of the songs, the, the talent of the musicians, and the actual performing of the music. David Lee Roth of Van Halen, who sung a, sang a song called Running with the Devil, he says, I'm going to abandon my spirit to emotion, which is actually what I attempt to do. You work yourself up into that state, and you fall into the supplication of the demon gods. Stick around for part four and you will see the state that the musician works up himself into. But he's talking about, I, I abandon my spirit, I fall into the supplication of the demon gods, he called them. Led Zeppelin, also the writing of the songs again. Who was the musician behind the music? Page and Plant also explained how they received the song Stairway to Heaven and other music, referring to themselves as, quote, a musical medium, channeling the music that was, quote, offered to them. Robert Plant stated, My hand started writing, I almost leapt out of my seat. Channeling. The word is channeling. This is how the master occult works of the 19th and 20th centuries were written. As I explained earlier, the devil would literally take over. Demons would literally inspire the writing of these, these works of, of, of Satanism. Jimmy Page, Sir Robert Plant, the same thing. He said, my hand just started writing. I almost leapt out of my seat. I was a medium. We channeled the music. How many other ways can I put it in spiritualist terms so that it's clear to you? Angus Young of the band ACDC stated it this way. It's like I'm on automatic pilot. By the time we're halfway through the first number, someone else is steering me. I'm just along for the ride. I become, there's the word, possessed when I get on stage. Someone else is steering me when I'm performing my live performances. I'm possessed, says Angus Young. Michael Jackson also, he says, when I hit the stage, it's all of a sudden a magic from somewhere that just come, that comes and the spirit just hits you and you lose control of yourself. Now we have the fruits of the spirit. We know what the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Michael Jackson just said, this spirit hits me and I lose control. Is this the Holy Spirit or is this an unholy spirit? This is a demonic spirit. Now we get on to more modern musicians again. We have Beyonce. I didn't really know much about Beyonce because I kind of unplugged from the music industry a number of years ago. But a student asked me, they said, Mr. Ritzman, you're presenting this stuff about, about music and the music industry. Do you know about Beyonce? Do you know about Sasha Fierce? Sasha who? So I looked it up. Sasha Fierce. Well, here we have Beyonce on the screen on the left. Notice her name on the left-hand picture is Beyonce. On the right-hand picture, she looks a little different, doesn't she? Her name is Sasha Fierce on the right-hand pictures. Notice on the left-hand picture, what does she have hanging from her wrist? A cross. Notice what's missing from the picture immediately to the right of that. No cross hanging from the wrist anymore. Instead, devil horns. But not just devil horns. You have Baphomet, the goat god, there on the image in front of her. That same goat from the um, pentagram that we saw earlier. Beyonce, a very interesting person, she put it this way. When I see a video of myself on stage or TV, I'm like, who is that girl? That's not me. I wouldn't dare do that. I created my stage persona to protect myself. 
Their stage persona is Sasha Fierce. So that when I go home, I don't have to think about what it is I do. Sasha is not me. I wouldn't like Sasha if I met her off stage. So she's got this alter ego, Sasha Fierce. Is it just an act? She looks at what herself on stage on TV and she says, that's not me. I wouldn't dare do that. Hmm. Here's what she has to say. I have someone else that takes over when I'm on stage. It's not just an act. And it gets even more demonic than that. She says, when I'm on stage, I, I, I'm not afraid of my sexuality. The tone of my voice gets different and I'm fearless. I'm just a different person. Things I do when performing, I would never do normally. Listen to the spiritualism here. I have out of body experiences. If I cut my leg, if I fall, I don't even feel it. I'm not aware of my face or my body. It's not just an act. Sasha Fierce, there's, in her words, I have someone else that takes over when I'm on stage. I'm not aware of my face or my body. I have out-of-body experiences. I couldn't say it any more spiritualist than that. And here I have on the screen, the, uh, this is not on her album cover artwork, this black square. I pasted on there to compare it with the Baphomet image above it so that you could see that indeed she does have that image of the goat god, which comes from paganism in the ancient times. Even in the Bible, by the way, you know, the sheep and the goats, right? The sheep are the ones that go to heaven. The goats are the ones that are destroyed. And in the Old Testament sanctuary system, they would proclaim the sins on the, the head of the goat and send the goat into the wilderness, representing Satan. So goat symbolism is, is a satanic symbol going back thousands of years. And she employs this not just on her cover out art, but also on a ring that she wears. It's that important to her. Baphomet, the goat god, there at the music awards. And also she does other symbolism too, Beyonce does. This is a, a, some sort of eye symbolism, and we need to start looking at, into that right now as we're thinking about who's the musician behind the music. What sort of, what sort of uh, communication is the music industry putting out with their symbols? And, and we might say that's silly. It's, what is this, some sort of silly secret society with a secret handshake or something? And to us, it isn't how we normally communicate. But if you study into the occult, which I don't men, men, recommend, by the way, to, to tr become a master of every, every occult practice out there, it's, it's study the Bible, you know, so if you if, if you want to, you know, confirm a few things from this from this seminar, do that. But then but then really focus your attention on positive things instead of trying to find all the all the dirt and all the conspiracies and all the, the satanic things in the world. For this presentation, by the way, I, I actually most of it I had already learned in the past. I, I collated it all together, did a little bit of research, but this is not even my thing, really. Uh, media on the brain is something that I do to share this information with people so that they can be freed from media addiction. But I don't go home searching more on this stuff. I've got enough information. I move on to important things. But it is important for us to know this and to know what this eye symbolism is all about. At the Super Bowl just this year, 2013, Beyonce flashed this symbol out to the millions and millions of people watching. This is the symbol, same thing as the eye symbolism. When her husband does it here, Jay-Z, he puts his eye in the triangle. This is what you might call Illuminati symbolism, but it even predates the secret society that was founded in 1776 in Bavaria and in Europe, the Illuminati. It predates that. Uh, pred it goes all the way back to ancient Egypt, and it's always been a pagan Luciferian symbol, the eye inside the triangle. But the, the media had, a, had an interesting thing to say about Beyonce. They, they said, oh, come on. All of you internet people out there who are making a big deal out of her symbol like that, you're all just a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists because really she was just promoting her husband's record label. But doesn't that beg the question, why does her husband's record label have ancient pagan symbolism on it? From Masonic circles and, and occult secret societies for many years past, why bring this old symbol out of the, out of the suitcase and, and everybody's flashing this triangle back at their great leader, Jay-Z, who we've read, his highest law is desire. The love of desire is his scripture. Why the eye symbolism? Take a look at other musicians also employing the eye symbolism. Eminem, Katy Perry, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, Bono. We're going to talk more about U2 in part four. Stick around for that. Michael Jackson and Justin Timberlake. What's up with the eye symbolism just exploding in the music industry? It's everywhere, especially in the last 10 or years or so. 
even you see Lady Gaga here doing it more than anybody else. She's, she's one of the top most 100 most influential people in the world, according to Time magazine. So you've got one of the, not just a musician, she is top of the line right now. And music about things I don't even want to talk about, about her relationship with Jesus and Judas and all of this stuff. I'm not even going to get into it. But she says, my art is liberation. I want to free you. And actually, Lady Gaga gets behind the backstage with her bandmates and has a prayer before they go out and perform. And it sounds like a Christian prayer. It's very deceiving. Um, be very careful with, uh, with these musicians, and when, especially when you see the symbolism they're using. And in case you didn't know, the, in the occult, they use symbolism like this to communicate with each other. It's a way of sort of tipping their hat to their loyalties, and it's their way of, they, they have this code of ethics where they kind of have to show their cards a little bit to the world. It's, it's, I know it's silly, but that's what they do. Here she's dressed up as an ancient pagan god, Anubis. Uh, also doing that with her hands as well. So Lady Gaga, a very important figure in this eye symbolism cult. Now before I tell you the origins of the eye symbolism, just real quickly, we mentioned Rihanna using the eye symbolism there again on the bottom left. Not a, not a lot of uh, digging that you really need to do to conclude that this is not holy. You've got dark angels with uh, black devil horns and uh, every manner of darkness and wickedness coming out from these musicians that grew up in the church in a lot of cases, that were innocuous, that were okay for a time, and then they turn very dark. We're going to talk about some more of them later. But back to the eye symbolism. Where did this come from? Carlos Santana stated the following in 1999. In my meditations, the entity called Metatron said, we want to hook you back to the radio airway frequency to reach junior high schools, high schools, and universities. Once you reach them, we want you to present them with a new form of existence. What form of existence is that? In Santana's words, remember your divinity. So Santana is having spiritualist meditations, experiences. He, he communicates with a demon called Metatron. I don't know if this is Satan or another. It doesn't matter. But this demonic figure says to him, we want you to go do an outreach program. The devil has an outreach program. It's called the music industry. You're going to reach junior high schools, high schoolers, university students. We want to get the young people especially. Remember what Aleister Crowley said. We're going to bring in an army of youth. So we want you to reach them and pre present them with a new form of existence. Remember your divinity. This is what he heard in his meditations with demons. In fact, he also heard, according to the 2000 Rolling Stone, March 16, that Metatron is represented by the, guess what? the eye inside the triangle. This is why this symbol has become so popular. The, the, the final push, post 20th century, the devil shows up to, to Santana, who was one of these musicians that was involved with a lot of different other musicians, and he had been communicating with the dead too, with Jimi Hendrix and Miles Davis, or demonic impersonations thereof, rather. And you'll notice immediately after this, 1999, 2000, this is when eye symbolism starts to take off in our modern time. What is the message behind the eye symbolism? Remember your divinity. Who is it that said that in heaven? Who is, that, who is it that said that to Adam and Eve? You can eat from the tree and you will not surely die, but you will be like God. I, 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 I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. This has been the devil's message for over 6,000 years. It's nothing new. It's a new form of existence to many, but we know that it's a lie that dates back to the origins of evil. Well, it's not just Santana and the use of eye symbolism. There's other, other symbolism that you can find in the music industry. For example, Madonna's 2012 Super Bowl halftime show. Now, you'll notice on the slide I called it a Super Bowl service. Why would I call it that? Well, because on Anderson Cooper, Madonna described the importance that she attributed to her halftime show. This is Madonna. She said, the Super Bowl is kind of like the Holy of Holies in America. I'll come at halfway of the church experience and I'm going to have to deliver a sermon. It'll have to be very impactful. Hmm. So what did she do when she came out on the Super Bowl in 2012? Here's how she was escorted out. You can see this is ushered in by scores of Roman soldiers and women. Madonna's glorious entrance into the halftime show is a reflection of where she stands in the music industry. Very prominent individual in the music industry. In fact, her ritual costume here you'll see that it resembles the ancient Babylonian goddess Ishtar. Notice some similarities. 
You see the lion or the sphinx at the feet of Ishtar. You also see two lion or sphinx faces at the right and to the left of Madonna. It's not just that. You also see a distinctive headdress on Ishtar, two spires coming up. And similarly, we see the same thing with Madonna. In addition to that, you see three columns coming up and out from the shoulders of Ishtar. Again, Madonna, three co columns up and out from the shoulders. We also see wings on the uh, uh, Ishtar image here, a winged goddess Ishtar. Do you see the wings off the stage of Madonna's platform? To a T, everything that you can find here, we see also in Madonna's image. Notice also the sun. You see the sun at the top left of Ishtar, above Ishtar. Here's again, this is kind of small, but if you can see way above her throne, there's an M with a solar disk. So no surprise that the more things we find in here, the more similarities that we find. And in fact, if you look at the tarot card of the chariot, you also see something very similar. And this tarot card is used uh, to, to evoke you know, spiritual power in the occult circles. Speaking of evoking power, in invoking power, we have a winged solar disk that is displayed and illuminated upon the stage of, of Madonna at the end of the show. This winged solar disk has been used in occult circles for many centuries, even in the Masonic Lodge, you will find at the top of this image the same sort of winged solar disk. The winged solar disk was used in, in Egyptian magic to invoke spirits. Now, Madonna, being the high priestess of the music industry, if you will, in, in many recent years, you see all these other stars joining her in the occult. She's sort of the, if you will, the high priestess goddess figure of these folks who are using all of this symbolism. And you've seen many of them, but I want to take a look at some of the lyrics of some of them, because it's not just in the symbolism. And we're not going to analyze all the lyrics of all these groups. We're, just a couple examples will do. I want to show you Katy Perry. Katy Perry's song, Extraterrestrial. And this one, a student, the students always tip me off to this. They know what's going on. They know more of this than I do. And so I looked into the song, Extraterrestrial, after a student said, you need to look at that. It's pretty demonic. She sings, you're so hypnotizing. Could you be the devil? Could you be an angel? Now, we know out of the gates, we know that this is not a holy angel if he is hypnotizing. Could you be the devil? So this is a song about a demon or the devil. Your touch magnetizing. Now, if you look into the New Age practices and, and, and occult spiritualism, you'll find magnetism to be a very important aspect of, that, of those practices. Feels like going floating, leave my body glowing. Again, in the, in the occult, in the New Age communities, there's a practice called astral projection where you have an out-of-body experience that we already heard from Beyonce, Katy Perry, same thing. Going Feels like going floating, leave my body glowing. You're from a whole other, another world, a different dimension. You open my eyes. Who was it in Genesis 3 that said your eyes will be open and you will know good and evil and you will be like God? This is the devil's message. You open my eyes, she says, and I'm ready to go. Lead me into what? The light. What does the name Lucifer mean? Light bearer. And what does it say in the Bible about him? It says that he can transform himself into an angel of light. Want to feel your powers. There is this transcendental on another level. Boy, you're my lucky what? Star. Lucifer means the morning star. In the Bible, an angel represents a star. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven. I want to walk on your wavelength and be there when you vibrate. For you, I risk it all. So we see very much spiritualism, not just in the symbolism, but actual, the, actually the lyrics of the most modern musicians. When it comes to Eminem, I, I shouldn't really need to present a slide on Eminem. Uh, he, he was known as the art, artist of the decade in the 2000s, but his, his lyrics and the topics that he talks about, I'm going to spare you. Uh, we're looking at rape, murder, unbelievable things that I, that I don't even want to mention in an expose of it. Uh, but he's, he's the most influential musician, musician of the first decade of the 20th century.
And what I find interesting about Eminem is not just the horrific, immoral, violent, terrible lyrics and the terrible language used, but also you see the eye symbolism again and notice this E, this backward E. There's something in, in Crowleyanism called the satanic law of reversal where you are to talk backwards, walk backwards, think backwards, play phonograph records backwards, etc. These are ways that they practice Satanism. Is it any surprise then that the E is flipped backwards? Eminem said, Slim Shady, my alter ego, Slim Shady is just the evil thoughts that come into my head. And some of those thoughts, some of the songs sing of, of being demon-possessed and unbelievable, terrible things. If, if you know anybody that's listening to Eminem, it doesn't get much worse than this. It's really, really dangerous stuff. And we thought they were okay. We've covered a lot of different groups. We've seen a lot of different musicians who were inspired literally with their lyrics or their songs or the actual music from the demonic realm. We've looked at musicians who have channeled their music, who have talked about being possessed. We've looked at their lyrics being Satanic being do what thou wilt. But those are the bad ones. I can find some good ones. Remember the rat poison laden buffet? We stick around at the buffet. It's like, okay, he didn't put up my favorite musician, so I'm safe and I'll continue to listen to the few musicians at least that didn't show up in the seminar. Is that wise? I would suggest no for the following reason. I'm going to put a quote up on the screen from a musician. It says, we were doing witchcraft, trying to do witchcraft music. Now, if I asked you to guess who that musician was, you may say Ozzy Osbourne, Metallica, you know, uh, Marilyn Manson, you know, some of these groups that I'm not even putting on the screen because they're so dark and death-oriented and, and, and evil. Marilyn Manson was intentionally and blatantly anti-Christian. It's got to be one of those kind of bad groups that the bad kids listen to, right? Where, you know, the druggies and... Actually, I'm doing the spiritual sound, a white spiritual sound, religious music, that's the whole movement, that's where I'm going, it's going to scare a lot of people, said Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. The music that the good kids listen to, right? Pretty harmonies, it's just nice melodies, it's just music about surfing, it's harmless, right? It's not all this satanic stuff. Think again, they were doing witchcraft, witchcraft music. Now I never would have thought that. I never would have gone to that buffet and said, clearly, that one is filled with rat poison. I didn't know. Maybe I should ask the question, not which ones are filled with rat poison, but do I have confirmation and, and substantive evidence to conclude that they are not into spiritualism? That's what I need to find. Another one that I, I thought was okay, back in the 90s when I was a teenager, you know, I was into Nirvana and Metallica and all these terrible bands, and the good kids listened to Tori Amos and others like her. But then I found this quotation. Tori Amos sang a song called Father Lucifer and stated, I wanted to marry Lucifer. I don't consider Lucifer an evil force. I feel his presence with the music. I feel like he comes and sits on my piano. Wow. And we thought they were okay. Another one that I thought was okay and that the good kids listened to, Sarah McLachlan. In fact, the style of her music, In the Arms of an Angel, it's a pretty beautiful song. We're going to talk about musical style in part four. It's not objectionable at all. It's beautiful music. And I thought, oh, the angel. No, it's an angel. This is a religious song. But which angel? I think the devil has gotten a bad rap, she said. The devil is the fallen angel, the one who was willing to embrace the dark side whereas all the other angels were in total denial. The devil is more like us. In the arms of an angel. What angel is she singing about there? Sounds like she has an affinity for the devil. He's gotten a bad rap. He's the one willing to embrace the dark side. He's like us. Now what about some others that we thought were okay? You got your teeny bopper music, right? The young girls listening to your Taylor Swift, your Hannah Montana, the Justin Bieber. Hannah Montana, I don't have to say much about because she, she's Miley Cyrus and went from being the cute Disney, you know, just pop star, just fun stuff, to this overtly dark and highly sexualized singer. Uh, you look at that one for 10 seconds and you say, whoa, I mean, unless we've become completely desensitized, which maybe we have, look at it through new eyes, look at it through God's eyes and say, is that something that is appropriate? But the two on the left, especially the one on the top, Taylor Swift is very popular among Christian girls. Justin Bieber, again, very popular among young ladies. Well, I was asked to go look into them. I, I didn't know anything about Taylor Swift, but a student asked me, Mr. Ritzma, what about Taylor Swift? Uh, what about Justin Bieber? 
And so I looked up some of their lyrics, and I found a theme running through some of their lyrics. Both of them had lyrics similar to something like this. I'm going to talk on the phone to you late at night. I'm going to sneak out the window. You're going to come up the stairs of my house, and your mama don't know. And I'm going, this is what we're listening to at age 12 or even younger. Or how about any age? That's, not, that's inappropriate for a 25-year-old to listen to. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know what? We thought they were okay because they're not flashing occult symbolism and they're not dressed all in black like Ozzy Osbourne. But if you take a look at the lyrics, we find that if we're going to be guarding the avenues to our soul and avoiding thinking, hearing, seeing anything immoral, then we've got to take serious thought about these musicians too. Now, th- these ones are especially interesting to me. The one on the top right here is, is Carrie Underwood. She's actually a Christian. She sings, How Great Thou Art. And so I'm not going to make any comment on her, her faith, on her heart. I would never stand in judgment. But I do want to analyze the material she's putting out, as well as One Direction. Let's start with One Direction. I didn't know they existed. I presented this at a seminar, and a young person walked up and said, what about One Direction? Well, I looked at about two or three of their this, this lyrics to their songs, and here's, I think, the third one I ever found, maybe the second. It's, it goes like this. The party's ending, but it's now or never. Nobody's going home tonight. DJ got the floor to shake, the floor to shake. People going all the way. Yeah, all the way. I want to stay up all night. Hold on to the feeling and don't let it go. Because we got the floor now. Get out of control. I want to stay up all night and do it all with you. I don't think I need to explain the sexual innuendo there. But clearly this is not a holy scene. This is not a Bible study. This is not something that we would want to be encouraging in our imaginations. This is an all night dance party. Doing it all night with doing it all with you. Um, Clearly, and by the way, I had a student that I shared, I said, okay, I'm going to get up to One Direction. And the student said, okay, fine, fine, fine. They have, they have only two bad songs. And it's such and such and such and such. And it wasn't the one that I was putting on the screen. And they're like, oh, that one isn't really that bad. So apparently there's much worse. But again, I don't need to spend that much time. Let's just move on. And we'll see Carrie Underwood as well. I looked at, on, online for, for 10 seconds. I pulled up the first YouTube clip, watched the, watched the YouTube clip for 10 seconds. It was a clubbing scene with these people all up on each other. And it was highly sexually inappropriate. And I'm not going to say she's not a Christian, but that was not Christian. Clearly. And the, the song, the theme of the song was, I'm going to smash your vehicle in and damage and, 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 and um, destroy your truck because you cheated on me. The song was called Before He Cheats. Basically, I'm going to teach him a lesson. It's not what the Bible said, which is leave vengeance to God and forgive others and love your enemy. It's the opposite of that. I'm going to vandalize and destroy your property. And again, I'm not going to say she's not Christian, but that is not Christian. And I don't want to steer any Christian young people to listening to that sort of music either. Now, what about country music? I always thought that was okay because it's filled with patriotic values, even family values. But country music is kind of a funny animal. One song you listen to is highly moral and good and promoting of good values and American ideals. I'm all for it. Uh, And then the next song on the playlist you hear about, uh, alcoholism or adultery or, or these terrible scenes of, of rural immor- immorality in this case. And here's what Conway Twitty had to say about the country music scene. So don't take it from me, take it from a top insider. He said, as a country artist, I'm not proud of a lot of the things in my field. There is no doubt in my mind that we are contributing to the moral decline in America. There's no doubt in my mind that that area of the worldly music, of the secular music industry, has got a lot of rat poison too. Do I need to stick around and try and find the good stuff? Well, once you realize the open agenda of the music industry, you'll think twice. In session two, we looked at the open agenda of Hollywood and of of the advertising industry. But what about the music industry? Let's start again with Jay-Z. What does he have to say? He says, Jesus can't save you. Life starts when the church ends. He's not being very subtle. (laughs) An open agenda, anti-Christian Jesus can't save you. Life starts when the church ends, he says. He also calls himself Jehovah. This is not very subtle. You probably don't need the Urban Dictionary to define what Jehovah stands for, but here's what the Urban Dictionary explains it as. Jay-Z, a.k.a. Sean Carter, and the name Jehovah comes from Jehovah, another name for God. Jay-Z plus Hova equals Jehovah. And on the shirt there, he's got Masters of the Craft wonder what craft that is. Remember, he said, my brands are an extension of me. So the occult symbolism, again, all throughout the, 
all throughout the shirt, an open agenda saying, I am Jehovah. I am Jehovah. And Jesus can't save you. And the highest law is desire, by the way. We formed a new religion. Follow our religion. The MTV founder, Robert Pittman, put it this way. The open agenda of the industry. The strongest appeal you can make is emotionally. If you can get their emotions going. Make them forget their logic. You've got them. More on that in session four, on the effects of these music, the forms of music. But then he says this, at MTV, we don't shoot for the 14-year-olds, we own them. Think about that as a young person. We think that we're finding freedom by going into the media. I don't need all the rules and all of the legalism and all of the, you can't do this from the church and from my religious upbringing. I'm going to go find freedom in media and immerse myself in this culture of entertainment. But then you find out the Edward Bernays of the world that the Mark J. Ryans have explained. You're actually getting captured, that you're getting enslaved, that this area is not a place of freedom, but quite the opposite. You're getting owned. That's not my word. That's Walt Mueller. That's uh, rather Robert Pittman's words. At MTV, we don't shoot for the young people. We own them. The Beatles said Christianity will go. It will shrink and vanish. I will be proved right. You just wait. We are more powerful now than Jesus ever was, says John Lennon. The open agenda of the industry. Listen to this one. You've heard the song maybe, My Sweet Lord. It sounds like a wonderful Christian song. George Harrison explained it this way. My idea in My Sweet Lord, because it sounded like a pop song, was to sneak up on them a bit. The point was to have the people not offended by hallelujah, and by the time it gets to Hare Krishna, they're already hooked, and their foot's tapping, and they're already singing along, hallelujah, hallelujah, to kind of lull them into a sense of false security. And then suddenly it turns into Hare Krishna, and they will all be singing that before they know what's happened. And they will think, hey, I thought I wasn't supposed to like Hare Krishna. You see how they subtly get the Eastern religion slid into there so all the Western American Christians who, are, who like the sound of hallelujah, they get accustomed to it, they're tapping along, and all of a sudden they're now honoring Hare Krishna. It's all happened subconsciously. More on that in session four. How about Elvis? We haven't talked much about this individual. He was known as the king of rock and roll. Now if you know your history, rock and roll was a sexual innuendo. I won't explain that, but to be called the king of rock and roll is to be called the king of something highly inappropriate in the context outside of a monogamous committed marriage. And here we have Elvis dancing as if he is engaged in that very act. And I hate to say that, but they used to not permit him to be filmed from the waist down on television because of how inappropriate his dancing was. And usually when I hear that story told by a, by a historian or somebody of today, they'll say, oh, remember in the olden days when we were so prude and we you know, wouldn't allow them to show Elvis's... Well, wait a minute. I'm not interested actually in society's standards. I'm interested in God's standards. Shouldn't we be saying, yeah, that's disgusting. I think that image is disgusting. He's not even moving. So I, I, we become so desensitized that we forget what God's standard is. I don't think the angels are dancing like that in heaven. So we have to ask ourselves, is that just because in the olden days we used to be so conservative about it? No, I think we need to recapture some of that. Be resensitized, as we said in session one. You know, Elvis, of course, got into drugs and all sorts of uh, immorality. And he went back to his boyhood pastor. He said to his pastor, I've done everything you taught me not to do. And I'm the most miserable man in the world because of it. It's a serious thing. But I've been told that he was a gospel singer. You know, we as Christians should listen to that, encourage that aspect of the Elvis legacy. A gospel singer. Was Elvis a believer? Let's read. Elvis constructed a personalized religion out of what he'd read of Hinduism, Judaism, numerology, theosophy, mind control, positive thinking, and Christianity. Of course, when you add all those together, you completely lose the Christianity. But the night he died, he was reading the book Sex and Psychic Energy. Elvis loved material by Guru Paramahansa Yogananda, the Hindu founder of the Self-Realization Fellowship. In considering a marriage to Ginger Alden, which never came to pass prior to his death, Elvis wanted the ceremony to be held in a pyramid-shaped arena, quote, in order to focus the spiritual energies upon him and Ginger. 
Elvis traveled with a portable bookcase containing over 200 volumes of his favorite books. The books most commonly associated with him were books promoting pagan religion. Theosophy, numerology, Hinduism, all these things, combine it all together. And that's the religion of the king of rock and roll. The Rolling Stones were very subtle in voicing their sympathy for the devil. Actually, not so subtle. They named their album Sympathy for the Devil. The song Sympathy for the Devil goes like this. Please allow me to introduce myself. You see if you can figure out who this is. I've been a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. I was around when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Made blank sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his, Jesus' fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. Well, then he doesn't require us to guess because he says, just call me Lucifer. This is a song written from the point of view of the devil. I made sure that Jesus was crucified on the cross, he sings. And this, by the way, was a song that was covered, that means played by another group, and that group was U2. And we're going to talk again about U2 in session four. Make sure to stick around for that. But that song has gotten a lot of mileage, not just from the Rolling Stones, but from U2. These are two of the probably top ten musical groups ever. Rolling Stones and U2. Very, very prominent song in the music industry. Sympathy for the devil. And Mick Jagger, the open agenda of the industry, right? We are moving after their minds. And so are most of the new groups. We're not here to just entertain. We are here to move after minds. How about changing the value system? We have Madonna and Britney Spears at the MTV Music Awards in 2003 singing this lyric. We're bored with the concept of right and wrong. And then they, of course, engaged in the famous lesbian kiss of these two seemingly heterosexual people to just burst the boundaries of anything traditionally moral or biblical. Madonna had previously stated the following. Maybe they'll be unconsciously aroused by it. If people keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it, eventually it's not going to be such a strange thing. I'll put out every manner of sexual immorality and depravity that I can. Every deviant form of sexual behavior I'm going to display before America. And if they keep seeing it and seeing it and seeing it, maybe they won't think it's so strange after all. It's the open agenda of the industry to change the value system. That's what David Crosby put it as. He says, I figured the only thing to do was to swipe their kids. I still think it's the only thing to do. By saying that, I'm not talking about kidnapping. I'm just talking about changing the value system, which removes them from their parents' world very effectively. And don't think you won't be influenced by it. You might say, oh, I know the lyrics are bad, but you know, I'm just listening to it for the music. You've got to see part four. You will see the unbelievable power of music, what it does to the mind. But I want to close with a Bible text and then a quick story. Here's what the Bible says about our rat poison laden buffet. It says, Therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. And if you're like me, you're going, but, but I love so and so. Are they into spiritualism? They didn't show up in the presentation. But you know, I've, I've eaten those so and so's before, thinking it was okay. For example, my favorite band of all time, I was obsessed with them, went to their concerts, followed all the news about them, I was obsessed band called Weezer. Later found out that the lead singer is a practicing um, New Age meditator. He, he's very much in an hour in the morning, hour in the evening, he's engaged in New Age meditation. And I, I just thought it was nice music. And then I look back with more objective mind and I'm going, yeah, those, a lot of those songs really were highly inappropriate. Not to mention the style of the music that you'll find out in part four it has a major effect regardless of lyrics. But I want to close again with a story. I was having a conversation with a uh, pastor uh, who happens to be ministering in the Hispanic community. And he came across a practicing witch. And I was just having a conversation with the, with the, with the witch. And, the, and he said, you know, what do you do for a living? You know, how do you, how, do you, how do you make ends meet? And the guy said, well, actually, people pay me money to be able to get a woman to go with them. So in other words, man A pays me money to get the woman to leave man B and go with man A. Wow. So you can just, what, cast a spell? He says, yeah, I cast spells, and I can get a woman to leave her husband and go with this man who paid me money. And I could do that with, any, I could do that with your wife. I could get her to leave you and go with another man. Well, at this point, the pastor says, um, I don't think you could do that with my family. 
because we're Christians. Well, at this point, the witch says, oh, I get Christians all the time. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. And this pastor again says, well, I'm telling you, you would not be able to touch my family. The witch says, okay, let me ask you a few questions. I'll entertain this. He says, do you watch TV and worldly things, soap operas, these kinds of things, and movies? Do you listen to worldly music? I don't think he used the word worldly, but do you listen to music? The pastor says, well, we sometimes listen to classical music, but mostly just sacred music. And he said, no, I'm not talking about classical. He's talking about, I'm talking about the jazz and the country and, the, and these kinds of music. And he said, no, we don't listen to those things. Do you have uh, worldly magazines? Do you have novels? Do you have these kinds of things in your home? No, no, we don't. Do you have any secret sins? No, I'm, I, I, I've been saved by Jesus Christ from time to time. I slip up, but no, I'm not living in an open rebellion in, in a secret way in my life. I don't have any secret sins. And the witch says, okay, well, I have to acknowledge I would not be able to touch you. I would not be able to get your wife to cheat on you. I would have no power over you. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is if we allow these things into our homes and into our lives, the spiritual realm can make claims upon us based upon what we invite into our lives. We say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let the devil in the front door. I'm going to the church. I'll go to church. I'm not going to have Aleister Crowley and study him, but I'm going to let the devil in the back door by letting the music industry into my home, every manner of immorality from Hollywood, you name it. It's all, it all can come in. And at that point, we've lost the first part of that verse from James that we quoted earlier. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. If we're not living in submission to God, we can't claim the rest of the verse, which is resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's why I get story after story from people, as I mentioned in part three. I get stories from people who are experiencing stuff they did not want to see in their homes. And maybe it's not the oogie boogie scary stuff. Maybe it's just temptations. Maybe we're just feeling overcome by sin. I wonder if the devil's gotten a backdoor key into our lives and into our homes. Think about this verse. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. That buffet is not a place to go find the things of God. We can find the true and the good and the beautiful at the buffet table of the Lord. That's my challenge today. That's how the Lord challenged me. And I pass it along to all who might hear. And remember, to share this message is like it says in Ezekiel 33, that if you don't warn a wicked man from his sins, from his, warn a wicked man from his ways, you become a partaker, you become responsible for it. So this message in a church that has become so worldly, that has allowed every manner of Satan's material into our lives, we've got to take this question very seriously. Do we want to be the 144,000 in white robes who overcome by the blood of the Lamb? If we do, it's time for a thorough cleansing of all things worldly from our lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, may we never take our eyes off him. Even as now we've had to take a moment to get a glimpse at the darkness of not just the music industry, but what's happening in all throughout the entertainment industry. Lord, we don't want to get immersed in even analyzing that. We want to turn now to you. Remember your provision for our salvation. To remember that there's nothing we can do or have ever done that would so make you not love us and save us. So long as we repent. And Lord, we pray that you would give us repentance, that you would give us faith, that you would give us the strength to overcome. We have a hard time even looking up to your throne. Sometimes we feel like we've gotten ourselves in such a big mess. But Lord, we know you extend forgiveness as the father of the prodigal son with no conditions attached. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and love. We pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to cleanse our lives of all of this spiritual garbage. Lord, if we need an accountability partner, if we need somebody to help, help us out with this, to throw some things away, to get some things out of our home, give us that strength to humble ourselves before a friend, before an elder, before a family member, to really follow through with what we need to do. Father, we want to be recorded on the books of heaven as having homes and having lives that are completely sanctified to you, where we touch no unclean thing. And we know, Lord, then you can receive us. 
In Jesus' name. Five invalid arguments concerning baptism. One, I don't need baptism because I trusted Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Mark 16 and 16. In John 6, 29, Jesus said faith was a work. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. James 2, 26 says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We see in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So, not getting baptized into Jesus Christ is to disbelieve Him. Paul connected faith and baptism. For you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3. 26 through 27. 2. The thief on the cross was forgiven and didn't need to be baptized, so neither do I. First, nobody can say if he was baptized. That's unknown. The thief died in the Old Testament, and Jesus had power to forgive sins. Before his death, Jesus directly granted forgiveness to some people. Mark 2, 5 through 12, Luke 7, 48 through 49. John 8, 1 through 11. The thief is just another such case. Second, and more importantly, baptism was not even instituted into the New Testament. Salvation in the name of Jesus is based upon his death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 7. Jesus did not give the great commission of Mark 16, 15 through 17, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20 which re requires baptism until much later. 3. Some, in wishing to deny the importance and purpose of baptism, claim that the original Greek word, EIS, which is found 1,750 times in Acts 2.38, means to be baptized because you have already received remission or forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said his blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. Did Jesus shed his blood because people already had forgiveness? 